so welcome to the second episode of the microphone podcast uh, in today's episode we're going to be speaking about building your own artificial pancreas that's what we call the title and we'll speak about essentially whether it is an artificial pancreas or whether there are any limitations so what essentially is um this building your own artificial pancreas and who i'm with is i'm with eric for eric is an uh, adventure filmmaker he's cycled over 10,000 miles um, and he's doing all of this with type 1 diabetes and he's currently using what many people consider uh, artificial pancreas and what I want to touch on uh, with Eric is his experience with this, um, his journey with diabetes and what a lot of people don't know is I'm actually type 1 di diabetic myself so I've had diabetes for 19 years and I currently don't use um, this configuration that Eric's currently using. I do use an insulin pump and a lot of people think that insulin pump itself provides this complete automation uh, of insulin delivery and carbohydrate control, which it doesn't. A lot of that data is inputted by myself. Um, so I'm just going to allow uh, Eric to introduce himself and speak about how long you've lived with diabetes. Yeah, thank you so much for putting on this podcast and having me on. And, you know, for a frame of reference, especially if this is going to the medical side, they can appreciate that type 1 diabetes has actually been in my family since 1943. Mm -hmm. And so my grandfather had it. And when he was diagnosed every decade of his life, he was basically told he was going to die, you know, just to give some context to everyone, you know, that was not that long after the invention of insulin, they didn't really understand that carbohydrates impact your blood sugar. And every time I'm guessing he went to an endocrinologist, which could have actually just been a general doctor as well. They basically said like, you're a dying man. Like, good luck if you make it to your 20. Good luck if you make it to your 30. Good luck if you make it to your 40. And so he lived until he was in his 80s, which is remarkable. And so when I was diagnosed as a teenager, which is now 13 years ago, I was able to instantly have like an optimistic part of my mind saying I can live a long life with this and I'll have a lot more advantages than my grandfather had. And what resonates with me, what you said, is that people believe where insulin pump therapy is currently. I'm always telling people, like, go back 10 years in terms of your mind. Like, I know you think this is, re like, relieving a lot of burden, exactly. um, but it's really manual. And it's interesting because even um, the ADA has a huge science convention each year. And one of the studies I saw was that actually an increase in technology is actually led to worse A1C results in America. And so when I, you know, and give some context of how I've managed my diabetes, you know, I've done multiple daily injections. I've worn the older Medtronic pumps. I wore the Omnipod. I've worn Medtronic 670G, which is the first kind of hybrid closed loop. Um, I've seen a lot of what Tandem is capable of. That's another American company. Yeah. And it's now been about two years since I've been on the do-it-yourself artificial pancreas, kind of known as loop. And it truly has been uh, life-changing. That's amazing. And you kind of touched on the next question that I wanted to ask you. Um, so I wanted to ask you about how your diabetes management has changed from your first diagnosis uh, to now. Because when I first was diagnosed, um, I started using syringes. Um, and I'm so, I used to be so afraid of change. So even when they told me about the pen devices, I was like, no, I don't want change. <laughs> and then they told me about the insulin pump and I was like, I don't want change. So how did it start with you? Um, what sort of, how are you delivering your insulin initially? And how did that, that change over the years? Well, I think for like a frame of reference, you, you see it floating around, but you know, there's over 42 factors that impact blood sugar management. And overall, we as people living with type 1 diabetes in some way or the other have to try to accommodate all of those. And it's kind of a ridiculous task. You know, if I really look at it, like 
a lot of times I would go into the endocrinologist, right? I was a teenager and they'd say, what's your schedule? And I'm like, I'm a teenage boy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm growing, I'm running around, I eat at 2 a.m., I play video games, I wake up for school at six. And I just felt like my doctors were always telling me like, what's your schedule? And then I'm like, I'm a college kid, I don't have a schedule. And then like after that, you know, and like type one diabetes is something that brought me into endurance sports as that challenge, you know, saying like, you know, and, and, you know, going back 10 years, like when I went off to college, there was no resources about being a college student with type one diabetes, yeah. you know, and a blog I was managing at the time was collegediabetes.com, you know, like okay. two very obvious words yeah. put together, but no one owned that domain. And I just share that as saying like, these online resources, which are becoming more and more abundant, like they weren't there. And so as a patient, I always felt like I was having some sort of unspoken like dialogue or compromise with my doctor where I'm like, hey, here's my life. It's not nine to five or here's this activity. I want to get into half marathons or marathons or biking. What's your advice? And a lot of times they'd just be like, good luck, you know, with a giant question mark, like, let me know how it is in three months. And it's pretty insane because if you think about it, it's like this disease is changing every 24 hours. And yeah. so even if you're seeing an endocrinologist, you know, like when I'm like, so like, doctor, like, how are my basal rates doing? How are my carb ratios? And they like make some adjustments. And then they're like, let me know how it is in a week or two. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so crazy, because like this disease changes every 24 hours, if not every hour, if not every five minutes, yes. if not every minute. And so it's like, this huge burden put on patients and like you don't have a great way of managing it yet even with the technology that is commercially available you know and so like I guess the, lot, the short answer is like I've been on almost everything and it's only until I started looping that I actually said here's a system that I can be honest with that will give me the results that I want without like too much compromise exactly and the large majority of that management uh, is completely by ourselves uh, because there's there isn't the capacity for someone to be overseeing your control and you need something that's flexible and can work around any changes within your day um, and especially with with exercise I completely struggle <laughs> with exercise so when I see you um, see you doing these ten thousand miles that you've done over America and I'm thinking this is just crazy <laughs> because I struggle just for a jog if I'm completely honest with you but and I always see you stashing um, a bit of glucose with you <laughs> just for that quick quick shot so what I want to touch on next is the fact that you created this uh, this essentially this community uh, called the Dia Badass community so you quit, created this website Dia Badass so what is Dia Badass and what inspired you to start Dia Badass Dia Badass is an education platform for people living with type 1 diabetes. And a large difference is that it's also member funded. And when I discovered Loop, it was a moment where I said, this is what we're waiting for. It is one open source. And so we can talk about safety later, but it's designed by the community. It's transparent. But I thought more importantly, it's accessible across all countries. Um, the technology, you know, in theory could evolve without that much, you know, cost or, you know, but it was just like, at the end of the day, for me as a person living with type one diabetes, I was like, this is what we're looking for. This is a low cost solution that is giving me an actual solution and, and to put it into frame when I biked across the US, so I went from Virginia up to British Columbia. I didn't, I wasn't looping. I brought a Medtronic pump with me and I brought an Omnipod because I used to kind of like do MDI for six months and then yeah. I would do the pump for six months and then I'd bring an Omnipod because I'm like, well, it's waterproof. So that's like helpful if I get caught in a storm. And then like, I would just switch in between them because at the end of the day, it was just a convenient way not to take shots. But yeah. like, and I ride with another type one diabetic. And so like, if you typically went into the doctor's office and they said like, okay, 
if you want to have steady overnight blood sugars, just don't eat, you know, after 10 p.m. And I ride, you know, the longest day I rode was 140 miles. I get in at 2 a.m. I'm going to eat 2,000 calories and pass out, you know? And it's like, okay, so like, what do you do with these situations that actually happen? And, you know, it's just interesting because I also rode down the whole West Coast of America without a continuous glucose monitor, just checking my blood sugar. But like, when you do these things, your risk just increases. Like, exactly. I think people yeah. think I somehow have like magical blood sugars. I'm like, no, when I'm riding 80 miles and eating 5,000 calories, like I am taking just big risk because I have big sources of carbohydrates with big sources of insulin and no automation at the end of it. And that's like really difficult. And so like die badass was just saying like, this is this thing that changed my life. At the time, no one was talking about it publicly. You know, I have one of the first well-edited YouTube videos about loop and then was writing articles. Like a lot of times if you type like do it yourself artificial pancreas on a lot of the American blogs, like I'm the author of those, not to say that there wasn't a community there before, but I was just like, this is the perfect solution for me. I don't know why people aren't talking about this. And like, I'm going to advocate about this as much as possible because like just without any kind of of like conflict of interest or anything kind of silencing things. Like I thought this would be like number one, most talked about thing. And, and so like, that's kind of what started diet ass. And now we have other stuff like workouts and things, but like, to me, that was really at like the core of it saying like, I believe in loop. I believe this should be talked about. And like, I will give you my own personal journey of like how to get set up because it's really intimidating i think that's what people forget like the setup process is intimidating but it doesn't have to be exactly so now let's dive into um uh, looped so what what does what is uh the loop device and how how long have you been a looper so i know you touched on that before i remember watching that initial video of you in february i think it's february 2018 and i looked at that video and i was like this is amazing. And at the time I'd never heard of anything about it. So just uh, for those listening, what is uh, Loop? How does it work? And how does it keep you uh, within your range? And how close is it to an artificial pancreas? Yeah, so the way I describe Loop is that it's an open source piece of software that connects your insulin pump to your smartphone. There's a bit more than that, but that's kind of where I leave it off is that my smartphone starts making automated adjustments for me. How that actually happens is that at the time and starting to change is that people in the community living with type one diabetes said, why is my insulin pump not talking to my continuous glucose monitor, not talking to something that can run an algorithm? And there's some incredible coders who developed years of their lives. A lot of them are now hired by the industry in a broad sense because they figured out how the communication protocol worked on an old set of Medtronic pumps. And as of a year ago, also the older Omnipod, which are still available and said, okay, we now know how this communicates. And so they built a device, which is called a Riley link. And I believe Riley is off of someone's child. So you can see that a lot of the motivation here is either a child or someone personally trying to innovate. And then they built the code once they figured out the communication process to say, okay, like now your insulin pump talks to your Riley link, Riley link talks to your smartphone. We'll now put software on your smartphone and then things start to automate. You know, and still requires user input in terms of your meals, your basal rates, your carb ratios, your insulin sensitivities. But where previously, you know, as a person living with type 1 diabetes, maybe we're glancing down at our phone to check a blood sugar and then in our own minds running this calculation, you know, and say that ends up being 20 times a day. Like I now have something that every five minutes is running a calculation and making an adjustment. And so the biggest change overnight is that one, like I actually got solid sleep. I've had almost no nighttime lows and I can pretty much 
guarantee that every day I'll wake up in range because it's slowly making adjustments overnight, you know, but there are limitations. One of the main ones being insulin is still a terribly slow drug. And so even if you're making automatic adjustments, you still have, you know, a six hour <laughs> active time period and a 90 minute peak. And so you can't really pull the brakes back and you can't really throttle it up quickly, but it's a huge step forward. And it's also definitely inspiration for the commercial pump systems. And then a lot of this work has actually turned into a nonprofit called Tide Pool, which is trying to make an FDA approved version of the app, which now Medtronic, Tandem, and I believe Omnipod have all made announcements that they're going to be partnering with Tide Pool to basically bring this software technology onto their hardware, which is their insulin pump. That's amazing. So people often use these terms. Um, they say, well, I'm open looping or I'm moving towards closed looping. What is the difference between open and closed looping? And what does it mean to have a closed loop device? Yeah, so open loop means that the that the phone or the pump won't make any decisions for you. It'll just make recommendations. And you can also see this in, you know, the commercially available insulin pumps now. Like when I was wearing Medtronic, sometimes they would kick you out of closed loop, meaning it's now almost acting as like a traditional insulin pump. But what's nice is that you can look at the app and say, okay, like, the pump right now thinks I should increase my basal rates or should give myself a bolus. When you're especially starting off and building trust in the system, you can look at it and say, you know, would I normally take two units of insulin for what it's recommending? And if you think that lines up, like then you approve it and how you approve it is with your, you know, scanning your finger or typing in the code on your phone. So if you believe in the security of your phone, you should believe in the security of this uh, and then send it over to your insulin pump where when you're closed looping every five minutes, it's pulling in that new continuous glucose monitor information from like your Dexcom G6 or the G5 or some of the other systems and then updating that kind of in real time to update the algorithm and then it will make an adjustment, you know, so just to paint a picture, like if you just ate and you were rising and I said like, okay, like I'm expecting it to look like this bell curve, but then all of a sudden that next reading like drops down because all of a sudden you stood up and walked or started jogging, like then the pump might automatically suspend itself for a moment because okay. like all of a sudden that, that curve shifted dramatically. Okay. Um, so in terms of people querying the safety of allowing an algorithm to act upon these changes in your blood glucose levels what do you say to people that say is this safe and the fact that currently this is something that's not regulated you know so first i'll say like i'm speaking from my own experience my understanding is that loop is also seen as a self-experiment and so one reason it's not uh regulated under the fda is because nothing's actually sold so kind of moving on from that, as just a person living with type one diabetes, I would say, think about the decisions that you make and do you think those are all safe? So think about the times that you wake up and your blood sugar is 40 or 2.4 for those abroad and you go, where did I mess up? Or you take that moment and your blood sugar is 400 or like 18 and you go like, where did I mess up? You know. Type 1 diabetes inherently is very risky. And now I'm on a system where it's helping me every five minutes make over 500 decisions for me to ease my burden and in my mind, keep me safer. And that's what I've experienced, but it doesn't mean that there's not a trade-off. And that's why also when you just go onto any insulin pump, you weigh the pros and cons, you know, like there's a risk of every type of management with type 1 diabetes. And so automation has that you know but also yeah. has the ability to take better care of ourselves exactly and what, what i normally say to um when i when i was actually I, i'm very much interested in it um and i was speaking to you briefly uh, prior to uh, starting the podcast is the difficulty 
of me getting on to, getting onto the device but more and more clinicians are understanding that people are moving on to these di- onto these devices um my uh, diabetes my diabetes nurse that looks after the looks after the pump device actually says that they're in currently they're writing guidance on supporting um these patients that are on a loop device they can't endorse it but at the same time they want to support um they want to support patients that want to make that decision because at the same time you still want that diabetes care uh, with it but the same i use the same argument um in terms of my diabetes management um would i trust an algorithm the reason why i would um is because the large majority of my highs and my lows are my poor decisions <laughs> and as as a diabetic if you're injecting so many times you'll know that if you're injecting so many times a day there's so many poor decisions that we make <laughs> on a daily basis and you have to for- forgive yourself and keep going forward if you've got something that's calculating those doses that would be better than what i can do and can rectify the mistakes that i make then i would put my trust in that more than myself as i've learned over the years um but like i said to you before it's a difficult decision for me because i'm a healthcare professional so at the same time i have to say well it's not endorsed but, but i'm a diabetic and in that sense it's this is the future and this is everything uh, that we've wanted how i wanted to ask you one another question was how has your diabetes management or your hba1c your long term control changed since you went onto the device has it improved it or has it just made it a bit more uh, tight knit but the values haven't changed yeah i'll say for my own a1c's you know one i'll be frank in saying it's been a while since i've properly checked my a1c results and part of that is many of my friends in the loop community they see their endocrinologist of course it's important to get a uh, yearly blood work or uh, you know halfway through the year but in terms of blood sugar management a lot of them are told you can come in once every 6 months or once every year now and the reason you know i haven't really been proactive about seeing an endocrinologist one i've been in india for the last 7 months uh I did so see that. yeah <laughs> <laughs> in terms of you know people who are listening to this you know i travel full time i've been abroad for um, or moving for almost 3 years and so it's hard for me to be in my home state and plan everything and like insurance and all that's a whole other conversation you know mm-hmm. but then why i feel comfortable that is cuz i get my dexcom reports every week you know i'm in range usually over 80% of the time my lows are usually less than 1% of the time i'd say my biggest struggle are with highs and so as from a clinical side people would be happy with those results and from a personal side the burden is just incredibly low for me you know so i also do adventure filmmaking as we mentioned and if i'm working at the computer for 4 hours straight I expect to be sitting there and be in more control, you know, be more at my target result than when I started yeah. and that's remarkable because our focus is broken so much saying I have to check my blood sugar in 15 minutes or 30 minutes just in case I'm drifting one point down, you know, and I have to per- catch a low by myself or up oh, I slowly started in range and then 3 hours later I'm now skyrocketing and you know and it's really important for clinicians to stay on top of this so they understand that you know I now manage my diabetes with my phone and so they have an app that they have to know the interface of at least to be able to communicate with that you know but then like my personal relationship with diabetes especially with the G6 now where I don't have any daily calibrations yeah. there have been times where like you almost forget you have diabetes management which is insane to utter and it makes me very optimistic for the future as like apple gets more into the healthcare system and just thinking about wow like it can start auto detecting my heart rate so it would know when i'm automatically working just in case i forgot a trigger you know and just start making those algorithms better and better and better to really reduce like the burden of this disease 
Wow, that's amazing. Um, so this is where the the first the podcast comes to an end. Um, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you about this. Um, and hopefully, if I have any updates on my end <laughs> for my search for so one thing that we didn't mention is the fact that a lot of the pump devices that are used for looping are not widely available. <laughs> you actually have to use a much older pump device um, that doesn't have essentially, it's like a firewall, isn't it? That that blocks you from having um, your phone connect to, to the device and make those changes. So it's very difficult to find these pumps <laughs> around. So that's one of the reasons why I haven't, um, I haven't found my own pump, but it was absolute pleasure talking to you and thank you for giving us an insight uh, on this pump device. And I will put your details uh, for Diabadas um, as well as your own personal page and, and your journey for people to take a look at. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, through Diabadas, I, try to make things as easy as possible just guiding people through the screenshots and also making it so there's a downloadable so you know what pumps to use so with that I'm always talking happy to talk about loop and and appreciate it